I want to welcome everybody to, for such a time as this, our Bible prophecy experience together. And I cannot tell you how excited I am about this. I've had the privilege in the past 12 years of doing seminars at churches week after week, mostly on the topic of media. My name is Scott Ritzamo, by the way, and a seminar called Media on the Brain that kind of went viral and kept us very busy <laughs> as a family, right? That's been my full-time gig, making a living doing those Media on the Brain seminars, but you know what I do for fun? Is this. Amen. Bible prophecy seminars. And I've done seven or eight of these, you know, three week type of events. And so tonight is night one. You have a schedule, I hope, for you to know what to expect. And you got to kind of think of it like you're building a house. Has anybody ever built a house? You bought a, a vacant piece of property and you put a house on it. I mean, first you got to clear the land, then you do the foundation. Then you do the, the framing, then this, then this. I've never built a house, so I won't pretend that I know what the next steps are, but I know that it's one step at a time and it builds on one thing after the other. So with a series like this, when you miss a meeting, it can be tough because there's assumptions that are made in the next meeting that we got what was in the previous meeting. And I know I do go fast, so we're going to have Q&A at the beginning of every meeting other than this one because we haven't had any content to discuss yet. But please ask your questions at the beginning of tomorrow about tonight's meeting and so on and so forth. So when we stand at the end of our three weeks together, just under three weeks, and, and, you, and you look back at this construction, this house that's been built, and I'm speaking not of a literal house in this case, of course, but of a system of Bible truth that reveals God's Word as so clear, so credible, so authoritative, and reveals Jesus Christ as so beautiful and as coming again soon and present with us. It'll be even a whole lot more just captivatingly beautiful than looking at that finished house. So stick with us each night as we go through this series. And I'm going to tell you the name of tonight. I've modified some of the titles since the flyers went out. This one is The Signs of the Times and the Most Incredible Prophecy. Has anybody ever been to a Bible prophecy seminar, by the way, where you went on for 20 or more nights? Some of you have been to a seminar. So ours is a little condensed, being 15 or so meetings. And that means we've got to sometimes do two prophecies in one night. So I don't want to leave anybody in the dust. We're going to go deliberately, systematically through the scriptures. Bring your Bibles to these meetings. You can open them up, mark in there with a pencil if that's your desire. If you don't have a Bible tonight, you can pull it right up on your phone. I'm going to be reading out of the New King James Bible tonight. But we're going to do those two prophecies. Daniel 9 is the most incredible prophecy. I can't wait to get to that one tonight. But I want to begin with a word of prayer because I believe that the living God who inspired this book is the only one that can help me to understand it properly. Not a teacher, not a speaker, it doesn't matter who that person is. You don't take his or her word for it, you take God's word for it. And the Holy Spirit that inspired these scriptures can also help us to understand them. So let's pray for that together. Father in heaven, we come before you now just simply asking for you to speak and that all of our thoughts and a speaker's ideas would all be just set aside and our prayer is thy will be done show us your word is truth and show us Jesus the living word who is the truth and the life and the way that we may walk in Jesus name amen what's that it's a boat yeah but it's not just any boat is it I heard the Titanic. You're familiar with the story of uh, that it sank, right? Over a hundred years ago now in the icy waters of the Atlantic Ocean. But are you aware of why it sank? It's not that they didn't know the iceberg, that, 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 that the iceberg was unknown. It was known, but what was ignored? Warning message after warning message. The messages that were given that would save lives were ignored. And I wonder about these messages that we are receiving from God's Word. How many of us today are not hearing, not heeding, not paying attention 
to the most important life-changing and life-saving words that God has for us. It takes me back to Matthew 24, in where, where Jesus shared in what's called the Olivet Discourse, or the Little Apocalypse. Now, that's not going to be on the test. You don't need to know that. It's just Matthew 24. But I like that term, the Little Apocalypse, because when we do a Bible prophecy seminar and turn to Matthew 24, sometimes it might surprise people that we didn't go right to the book of Revelation and study only the book of Revelation. Because most Christians who have a little clue about the Bible, they would go, well, Revelation is the one that it contains the last day's prophecies that are important to us in our time in which we live. And that is true. Revelation does contain those last day's prophecies. And it is the most important book we're going to study. However, did you know that start to finish, the entirety of the Bible contains 27% of the Bible by one count contains prophecy. So we're going to be studying all over the place in the Bible during our time together. Matthew 24 is one of those places. And I really like how he sat down and he starts speaking with his, with his followers. And they come to him privately. And they ask Jesus to please tell them, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Are you familiar with the second coming of Jesus Christ? It's often talked about. It is the most important epic event and the culmination of all the prophecies. There are hundreds of verses about the second coming of Jesus. The disciples want to know a thing or two about it. Tell us about this second. They didn't call it second yet. He was in the middle of his first coming, but they knew he was going to be coming with power and glory, and they wanted to know about it. We have a whole session coming. Actually, it's a portion of a session coming up on the second coming of Jesus. And it's going to be much of the theme woven through the entire series because that great event will change history. That will bring us to heaven and then heaven to earth. And I'll explain that more in the coming messages. But if you're in Matthew 24, I want to take you to verses 30, verse 36. This is an important disclaimer. If you're walking into a Bible prophecy seminar for the first time, you're going, okay, are these people nuts? Are they setting the date Jesus is coming next month or something like this? And I want to go to verse 36 where Jesus says, that day and hour no one knows. So the day and the hour. They said, tell us when these things will be and when is your coming going to happen? He's going to give them some indication of when it is near. But he's very clear in verse 36 that you don't know the day or the hour and nobody does, not even the angels in heaven. In verse 37, he gives a little clue about when we can know it's near. As the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So you will know you are near the second coming of Jesus when our world looks like the days of who? The days of Noah. That's in verse 37 there. Here in Luke, he says also, it'll be like it was in the days of Lot. Now, if you know the story of Lot, that was with Sodom and Gomorrah. Immorality abounding of divergent kinds. Noah's day, the only thoughts of mankind were only evil continually. Is anybody thinking this kind of sounds like our world today? immorality, only evil continually, and the earth was filled with what in Genesis 6 verse 5? Do you you know the story of Noah? Some of you know your Bibles. For those of you, this is new to you. You know about Noah and the ark probably, but did you know the earth was filled with violence? That's Genesis 6 verse 5 if you want to study that. So in our day, just the same. We don't need to recount all the shootings and the violence and the mayhem in the cities and the degradation of our culture and human society seeming to rip apart at the seams. Go over now to verses 6 through 8 in Matthew 24. I want to actually start with verse 8 where Jesus says, These are the beginning of sorrows. Now I'm reading out of the New King James. Some translations put that as the beginning of birth pangs. So the signs of the times, as they've been called, the the indicators in our world that show that Jesus' second coming is near are going to be like, what did he say? Like birth pangs. 
Now, maybe you know a little bit about birth pangs. Some ladies in here probably do. I certainly don't. I know, I know about them as from a safe distance. <laughs> but from what I understand from the research on the topic, the birth pangs start more uh, spread apart and more light. And then they get more intense and they get more close together. So when we study now verses 6 and 7, we should say, okay, we're going to expect these things to be increasing in their frequency and in their intensity as an indicator that we are getting to the birth moment, the second coming of Jesus. Let's read verse 6. Here are some of the signs that will be like birth pangs. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come pa to pass, but the end is not yet for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. So set that one on the shelf in your memory. We're going to come back to it. Wars and rumors of wars, nations rising against nations. And then he goes on and says that there will be famines. There's a second one. Pestilences. That's diseases. And earthquakes in diverse places. And we have the earth is filled with violence and immorality. So we're collecting a number of these here. Let's go to wars and rumors of war to begin. There have always been wars upon this earth since the fall, meaning the fall into sin, humanity's sin since Genesis 3. But the 20th century was unique. Over 100 million people died in wars in the 20th century. More than all centuries previous combined. And then after that, we had a Cold War with plenty of rumors of war and some actual hot wars during the Cold War period of Vietnam and Korea. And now, talk of World War III is at an all-time high. President Biden said a year or so ago that we've had a relatively peaceful world since the end of World War II. He called it a liberal world order. But he said that that period is transitioning and giving way to a period of what he called a new world order, where wars and tens of millions of people that's not quoting him, but that's what this would be if we were in a World War III scenario. Are we in World War III? Well, perhaps not, but there are rumors of it, aren't there? And so that one fulfills prophecy as well. Famines. That's another one on your list, right? Do you know there's a billion hungry people in the world today? According to Oxfam International, those facing famine-like conditions in the year after lockdowns during covid those facing famine-like conditions of hunger were sixfold what they had been previously. Um, even before the lockdowns and those disruptions in supply chains and so on, one child dies every five seconds from hunger-related causes. Is that not heartbreaking? This is fulfilling prophecy. We've never seen these kinds of vast numbers. In 2008, almost three million children died before their fifth birthday due to hunger and malnourishment. And these numbers, kinds of numbers, continue. I just happened to pull that one from 2008. Pestilences. You know, when I was doing these seminars before COVID, we would list all of the diseases that are scourges upon the earth. It's almost an unnecessary exercise at this point because now we know fully in our face the significance of pestilences or diseases in our world. And now they are discussing at the World Economic Forum right now or this past week, disease X and how to prepare for disease X. AIDS killed two million people per year. Heart disease kills 700,000 Americans every year. 700,000, that's like COVID level deaths, year after year after year. Cancer, 600,000 Americans per year. Over two thirds of those age 40 and up in the United States are now either diabetic or would be considered pre-diabetic. So these are lifestyle diseases largely. I appreciate Advent Health's giveaway bags there. Somebody from Advent Health heard we were having this and said, hey, we'll give you a gift. Um, lifestyle medicine is something that's growing in its, in its traction to say, maybe we can actually reverse diabetes. We have a message coming up on health, too. That one's like message number 12 or something. It's in a couple weeks from now. But these cancer, diabetes, heart disease are uniquely modern 
scourges and, and pestilences in that respect and the death toll that they are taking in, in prosperous societies, the death toll of this size at least. I don't remember growing up hearing about Ebola and mad cow and bird flu and Zika and all these scary sounding things and dengue and things I can't even pronounce, but it's the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. When in history have we seen such a collage of pestilences? Earthquakes. There, that's the next one on your list there in G Matthew 24, verse 7, right? There have been devastating earthquakes just in our recent years, in the last couple of decades. Can you name some of the countries? Yeah, so many of them. It's hard to... Nepal, China, Chile, Iran, Indonesia, New Zealand, Pakistan, Mexico... Uh, it goes on and on. The one in Pakistan killed 80,000 people. That was back about 19 years ago. The one in China killed 70,000 people in 2008. Haiti, I forgot, 220,000 people killed in that earthquake. This kind of thing didn't used to happen like this. And there were earthquakes, don't get me wrong. But the death toll from them, their impact on human society, which is what the prophecies have in view, is human redemption, is significant. Mexico's devastating 7.1 earthquake made headline news but that, since it had a big impact of destruction. But what a lot of people didn't know is there was one 10 times stronger at 8.1 just the year before that. The biggest earthquake in modern Mexican history happened just a few years ago. Now, I find the, the language here interesting. It says the earthquakes will be in diverse places. So Jesus specifically mentions not only will there be an increase in seismic activity, but it will be notably in places maybe you wouldn't expect. How about Oklahoma? I remember thinking of Oklahoma as Tornado Alley, but not earthquake zone like Southern California. But look at that. Starting about 2010, Boom, the graph starts to rise exponentially on the number of earthquakes in Oklahoma. It's called the beginning of birth pangs. So it's increasing in its frequency and its intensity as we approach the end. Now, I've, I remember hearing the skeptical viewpoint on this, which I appreciate. We should always question everything we hear in the media and elsewhere and measure it by, first and foremost, God's word and the biblical standard. And in addition to that, rational scientific methods. So, wow, you know, the earthquakes haven't been increasing. It's only that the impact of them. Well, I think that's still a fulfillment of prophecy, but I wanted to go on usgs.org.gov, US Geological Survey, and see have earthquakes actually been increasing. So I picked 6.0 or higher as my test because if you go with too low of an earthquake, then it will give you a false read of increases of them because our testing equipment has improved and it can pick up the smaller earthquakes with more sensitive equipment. So 6.0 is substantial. That's one that people feel. So in the 1970s, the average number of 6.0 earthquakes or higher per year in the 1970s, the average per year was 116 of them. In the 1980s, it was 129. So that's up a little bit, isn't it? In the 1990s, it was 154. In the 2000s, it was 161. And the 2010s, it was 165. So each decade seems to be increasing in the number of 6.0 earthquakes or higher per decade, per year, rather. Um, this one was a local Oklahoma news uh, graphic, and it showed that of, of, the, of the major earthquakes in Oklahoma, 4.5 and up, can you count how many of those were in the last 15 years or so? Isn't that something, like the vast majority of them? There's only a couple that were from decades or a century ago. 10 of the 13 biggest earthquakes in Oklahoma history were in his lifetime, pretty much. <laughs> my, my boy there. Um, there's another text not in Matthew that speaks of the signs of the times, and it adds one more. I don't know what I'm at here, but Jesus says in Luke 21:25 that also the waves and the seas will be roaring. That's on the screen, the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. And so do you, what do you think of as far as natural disasters when you hear the sea and the waves roaring? You think maybe of hurricanes and typhoons and this sort of thing. 
Yeah. Now, I remember hearing as a kid about Hurricane Hugo down in South Carolina and Hurricane Andrew down in Florida. I'm from Michigan, which, by the way, we love being in Florida in the winter. Thank you for having us. And this, you know, Michigan is made up of two peninsulas, right? And this one is called the Upper Peninsula and this one is called the Lower Peninsula. And I do free, feel privileged to live here because I can tell people where I live by pointing at my hand. That's not a privilege many human beings have. But what we've had to do is say, well, we, we snowbird pretty much down in Florida now, so we are bi-peninsular. And this is the lower peninsula and this is the upper one for us. That might offend our Upper Peninsula friends in Michigan, but what's not humorous is Hurricane Rita, Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Irma, that I don't even have the slides on for the latest because this PowerPoint is a, a little dated, but it just keeps getting worse, doesn't it? Um, these were the most damaging hurricanes that I just mentioned in my lifetime, more than the ones that I heard about growing up. And then the biggest natural disaster in American history. What was that one? Do you remember? Uh, Hurricane Harvey. Look at this. That's the same picture. The same, that's the highway. That's before and after. This is before and after. Houston, Texas. This happened. Does that not look apocalyptic? Hurricane Irma becomes the most, I meant Ian with you guys from last year, not Irma. Ian, Ian sorry. Luke 21 um, says something very important when we see these things. And that's easy for me to say when I'm in my safe home in Michigan when you guys are getting slammed with Ian. But remember that when people talk about World War III and what's the next disease going to be in the pandemic and the fear that I know natural disasters can cause. What Jesus tells us to do in the context of fearful signs is this. Now, when you see these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draweth nigh. A signs of the times talk like this about pandemics and earthquakes and wars and all of this is not meant to instill fear in us. Jesus says perfect love drives out all fear. Perfect what? Love. God is love. He, Jesus came to die for us to show us his love. And it is to that topic that we now turn to our second prophecy tonight. If you would like to turn to or pull it up on your devices, Daniel 9. This is what I've referred to as the most incredible prophecy. <clears throat> Daniel's prophecy, I'm going to give you, spill the beans, give you the spoiler. This prophecy is going to predict the exact timing of Jesus' first coming, which happened 2,000 years ago, it will predict when he is to be anointed, when he is to be crucified, and then one more thing that I'll tell you about as well, and it'll point, pinpoint the exact time, the exact year that he was to come. Is that the first time anybody's heard that in here? Because I would be so skeptical if I was in your seat and the guy in the front teaching the Bible said that. I'd be like, there's no way. So you hold, suspend judgment and see what God's word says. I think you will be impressed tonight. As I was the first time I encountered this and why I call it the most incredible prophecy. Some people like the one for Friday night, by the way. Daniel 2. Don't miss any of the meetings, but definitely don't miss Friday because Daniel 2 is tied for first in the most incredible prophecy in some people's book. Now, we're in the book of Daniel. That, that is the, you could call it the companion book to the book of Revelation. When Jesus spoke in Matthew 24, it's the little apocalypse, meaning the little revelation. Apocalypse means the book of Revelation. So when we say apocalyptic events, we're talking about events that we'll see in the book of Revelation. So Daniel, though, is, the, is in the New Testament or the Old Testament, Bible students? Daniel is in the Old Testament. And so this is prior to Christ's first coming. That Daniel was Revelation for them back then. And now we have Daniel and Revelation, and they're both, they build on each other, just like our house we are building together. Well, let's go to verses 24 and 25. Actually, before we read them, do you know what the context of this book is? Do you know who Daniel is? Daniel, of course, is a prophet because he's going to prophesy. But he's also 
an important, important figure in the history of God's people. You see, God's people, through the first part of the Old Testament, had had their ups and downs, and mostly downs. And they were often a rebellious people. God gave to the world the Ten Commandments written in stone. One of those commandments was very important. Don't worship any idols. We're going to talk about all ten of them, but that was one that the Israelites really struggled with. They just, I, don't, I want to be like the world and worship Baal and worship Ashtoreth and worship these gods. And God said, I want you to be my bride. I love you. I want to have an experience and a relationship and be with you. And so many times the Israelites said, no, we want our way, we want our way. And eventually God said to his people, you're going to have a consequence if you don't come to a, 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 worship, a true worship of God that is for your best interest. I give you blessings and curses, which would you like? My kids know a little bit of something about this. <laughs> things will go well for you if you obey. And if you don't, sometimes the consequence has to come in to teach. Have you ever heard of the ancient empire of Babylon? You're going to hear about that Friday night. And I'll give you the spoiler alert for Friday night. The reason Daniel 2 is so amazing is because Daniel is existing during the kingdom of Babylon. That's where the Jews were taken into captivity. That's their consequence. You are going to be marched right out of your city. You're going to be a captive nation in a foreign land called Babylon. Daniel was one of those young captives. You're going to hear more of his story Friday night, but Friday night's message is he's in Babylon, and he predicts through the prophetic word that God gives him what, that there will be a kingdom that comes after Babylon, and then another one, and then another one. And you might say, well, that's not that big of a prediction because, yeah, empires follow one after the other. Before Babylon, there was Assyria and there was Egypt. But hold on. There will be some reasons Friday night why you wouldn't expect other ones to follow. Babylon, though. But just granting that, he, he says there won't be another kingdom that follows that one. He's talking uh, hundreds and hundreds of years out into the future. He says the fourth kingdom isn't going to be conquered by another. It will be divided. And then you're going to see history and how that happened. Maybe I'm giving the whole message away right now, but there's more than that even. But how would he know that, the, that it would be divided, not conquered, and then that it would do this and it would fail at it, and then this would happen? I want to give Daniel 9 right now. It's so good, but I just had to give you the context of Daniel. Now we're going to study Daniel 9. Daniel is in this place. He's actually in the Medo-Persian Empire now as of Daniel 9. Same place, just uh, he's wearing a different hat now under a different king. And um, verse 24, we read, 70 weeks are determined for your people. This is an angel speaking to Daniel. 70 weeks are determined for for your people. Now, who are Daniel's people? They are the Jews, right? And the Jews are in captivity. Right. Now, they know that they're not supposed to be there forever, that God will bring them back to their land. But maybe they're wondering, when, when, when? And when will our deliverance happen? Well, God says, I'm going to give you a period of time, like probationary period, to do the following to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, that means to stop your, your sin, your iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. The most holy is a reference to their temple, a portion of their temple. So you're going to restart your worship services back in Jerusalem, once you've gone through this process of repentance and coming to the righteousness of your God. And he said it's a 70-week period of time, 490 days. So he says, okay, they're probably wondering, well, 70 weeks from when? 490 days from when? From you saying this right now? Or what's the starting point of the, like, when do we start? Verse 25 answers that. 
Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem. Pause there. Did you hear the word from? So you got 70 weeks, and then he says, understand this, from the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. So that's your starting point. Drop the pin on the historical timeline, boop, at a point at which there's going to be a command to restore and build Jerusalem. Had this happened yet in Daniel 9? No. He's saying in the near future, there's going to be a command. And when you hear that command, you know the clock starts ticking 490 days. So let's read on now. Oh, by the way, this Persian king is going to issue this command. And then from that point, you guys have 70 more weeks, 490 more days to come to repentance, to get back to Jerusalem and restart your worship system in the most holy place. And in, in the rest of verse 25 at the end, it talks about they're building a street again, building a wall again. Is anybody else going, this sounds like it's going to be really hard to accomplish in 490 days. <laughs> How do you get an entire nation brought back, build streets, build walls, rebuild your temple? You can't do that in 490 days. Okay. Well, for, for, by the way, where did we get 490 days? Because he says here, um, in the beginning, 70 weeks, 70, 77s, some translations say. But then it, in the middle of verse 25, you know what, let's just pull, let's go back to 25. Let's go to 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until, what's the next word in your Bible? Messiah. 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 That's a big word. That's, we know him as Jesus. He was yet future at this point. And from that command until the Messiah, the prince comes, there shall be Seven weeks and 62 weeks. How many is seven and 62, math students? Seven and 62 equals? Yeah, seven and 62 equals 69. So in 69 weeks, the Messiah will come? This is problematic, isn't it? We've got to do some thinking here. That's only like 16 months. And Jesus didn't come 16 months from this command. The Messiah didn't come exactly 16 months from that. So here's... Here's where studying the whole Bible really helps. When you encounter a text like that and you're going, I have a hard time making sense of this. Go to Ezekiel 4.6 and Numbers 4.13 and you read about how I have appointed thee each day for a what? A year. Each day for a what? Same thing. In Bible prophecy, one prophetic day equals one literal year. You will see this a number of times in several prophetic studies, and it always works. So hold, suspend judgment on that. There's some texts on it. So the Bible says that we can do that. We ought to do that. But watch how it works with Jesus' first coming. This is exciting. So let's work this out now. We had the 70 weeks as the whole prophecy. From the pin drop here of that command, you may now go back and restore your city till the end of your probationary time, Israel, is 490 days, but not 490 days, 400 actual, literal years. So that's a probationary period. And then it said, it said 7 and 62, 69 weeks, the Messiah will come. So that would be 483 years. Did I lose anybody on the math there? Do you want me to do that again? So the 70 weeks is 490 days or 490 Actual years. It says 70 weeks. Now, when the Messiah is going to come is 7 and 62. So 69 weeks. So three less years than 400, or seven less years than, seven less years than 490, right? Was that clear? Yeah. Okay. So you're going to find the coming of the Jewish Messiah, or the world's Messiah, 483 years from a command that is issued in Daniel's day that the Jews may go back to their homeland. Well, you can find that command. You can find it recorded in Ezra 7, verse 13, where the Persian king said, you may now go back and restore and build Jerusalem. And the historical record points that to be 457 B.C. The Persians, by the way, were meticulous record keepers. So were the Jews. 
So we have very good history inside the Bible and outside the Bible for dating these things. Uh, an established historical fact also establishes our prophetic date for the beginning of this prophecy to pull it forward. So now, let's just look at the beginning part of that, that 483 years till the Messiah. The decree is issued in 457 B.C. Are there any math students figuring out what year they would have been expecting the Messiah to come? <laughs> it's hard once you transition from B.C. to A.D. I know, I get it. And by the way, they didn't include the year zero when they started dating as B.C. and A.D. a thousand years ago or so. Um, I'll just give it to you. This is where the teacher just gives you the answer. You're like, Whew, oh, thank you. 27, 27 A.D. Now we're getting warmer here, aren't we? Um, did the Messiah come in 27 A.D.? What did happen in 27 A.D.? Well, he was alive for a while before that. But you got to know what the word Messiah means. This, this didn't predict that he would be born 483 years from here. It says he will be the Messiah 483 years. And some translations have, instead of Messiah, they have the anointed one. That's what Messiah means. So do you know when in Jesus' life, in the Gospels, when was he anointed? Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit at his baptism. The Holy Spirit descended like a dove upon him, and the Father said to him, this is my beloved Son. He's being identified and commissioned for his messianic ministry. When was this? Well, I like Luke. Luke is one of the best historical writers in all of ancient literature. You can ask, as long as they're being objective, Ask secular historians, Tacitus, Josephus, various ancient historical writers. How about Luke? How does he rank in the quality of his historical writing? The inclusion of dates, names, places, chronologies. He's at the top notch. Luke identifies in chapter 3 when Jesus was baptized that it was the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee. This is very reliable, not just for those who believe in the inspiration of God's word, but anybody who can validate history by looking at historical works would have to look at Luke on the same level as those others that I mentioned. In fact, the New Testament would be even better because we have more manuscripts of those ancient writings that date to closer to the originals. So the best ancient history that we have from the Roman Empire is actually the biblical account. Um, not to take away from the others, there's, there's good history in those too, but you cannot just cast Luke aside because he includes miracles like the secular historians do. But nonetheless, if you're at a Bible prophecy seminar, you probably have some confidence in God's word, but you certainly do now, even if you didn't before, because you're going, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We know from the history what year, the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar was. It was 27 AD. And Luke just said that was the year Jesus was baptized. It's, it fits hand in glove with the prophecy. And, and there are many more prophecies about the Messiah, too, that he would be born in Bethlehem, yeah. that he would come in riding on a donkey, that they would tear his clothes and divide them, that he, would be, that he would be pierced. I mean, there are so many things that indicate with certainty that Jesus is the Messiah. But this one is my favorite. I grew up with an understanding of the Bible, but not with this prophecy. I saw all the Messiah prophecies and thought, that's pretty compelling. What are the chances one man would fulfill all those? But this one makes it date sensitive, and it's just impossible that these things would happen all by chance. And it was in the Bible all along that there was a timing element to Jesus' first coming. We know that God sent forth his Son, for God so loved the world that he gave his only beloved Son, that whosoever believeth in him, should not perish. You know God gave his son, but you know what the first part of this verse says? When the fullness of the time had come. The time. What time? The one we're reading in Daniel 9. The one that said that the Messiah will come at that time. When that, when that time had been fulfilled or the fullness of it had finished, that's when God sent forth his son and spoke to him. Jesus in Mark 1, verse 15, says the time is fulfilled. 
and the kingdom of God is at hand. Did, did you ever notice that? It's in the first chapter of the Gospel of Mark. The time is fulfilled. So this Daniel 9 is not some obscure thing. The New Testament writers allude to it here in Galatians and in Mark. So we got a little bit more to go on the prophecy, though. There's another seven years left, right? By the way, this is not to scale. Anybody bothered by that who needs, needs that? Uh, sorry. It's just so we can see it and put the words on there. But this is the first 483 years, and then we just kind of zoomed in on the last seven years over there on the right-hand side of the screen. Let's go and study the last seven years now. It's in verse 26 and 27. It says, after the, after the 62 weeks, and by the way, what is that, the 62 weeks? Do you remember in verse 25 we heard about the 7 and 62? So he's saying after that 62, so in other words, after the 7 and the 62, because the 62 comes after the 7. So we might say after the 69, after the 483 years, 483 years, 483, thank you, yep. Yeah. So after the Messiah comes, the Messiah shall be, oh man, this is so, so important. The two most important words in this study tonight so far. Read it with me in verse 26. After the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be what? Cut off. Do you know that language from the Old Testament? This is death penalty language. To be cut off from your people was the ultimate death that goes beyond death, a judgment and a condemnation of that sinner. They would be stoned. It says the Messiah is going to have that? The Messiah, our deliverer, will be cut off? Well, what are the rest of the words? But not for himself. This is the gospel here. If, if you're new to that, if you, I've heard of the gospel. What does he mean by the gospel? Do you know that the Bible says that each of us has sinned? All of us have sinned. By a show of hands, has, everybody, has anybody lived a perfect life? Not a one. Think of the Ten Commandments. Have you coveted somebody else's fill-in-the-blank? That's the easy go-to one, because that's the one... Now, I've never murdered anybody, but you know what Jesus said? If you hate somebody in your heart, you've committed the sin again, the, the commandment, the sin of murder. Lust. You name it. We, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. We've all so, fallen short of the glory of God. And you know what the not the consequences of that, but the finality, the punishment of that is. God said to Adam and Eve, in the day that you eat of that tree that I commanded you not to eat, you would surely die. The wages of sin is death. We all have a death penalty hanging over us until the rest of the sentence here, which is the gospel. It's the good news. Don't, don't stay here, but recognize that without Christ... I am as good as dead. That is a fact as, as true as gravity or any reality you can observe. Because the Bible says the wages of sin is death. But those words right there just said, he was cut off, but not for himself. How about Isaiah 53? We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has laid on him, the Messiah, the iniquity of us all. He took your sin to the cross. What freedom that gives. What love that shows. Does that give you chills to know how deep the Father's love for you, how vast beyond all measure that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure? How deep the pain of searing loss when the Father turned His face away and laid on Him the iniquity of us all. And as the wounds marred that chosen one, they bring us to glory. The Messiah is certainly cut off, but definitely not for himself. It's that we might be saved. So how are we saved then? Through him. It says, if you confess your sins, this is 1 John 1, 9. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So I simply confess 
And then what's the, what's the reward of that? That's, that's incredible. Well, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. <laughs> so I don't have to perish. John 3.16 he gave us only son that we don't perish but have everlasting life if we believe in him, confess our sins. And part of that confession is the rest of this verse. Did anybody notice I didn't give you the rest of the verse yet? It's like, hey, wait, there's more there in black. I want to see what it says. There's what it says. This is not a word our culture likes to hear. It's offensive. You know what? Sin is offensive to God. And that's who I want to please. I want to be nice to everybody around me, but as a, as a preacher of the word, I would not be faithful to, to avoid and evade a call to repentance. We can't just be like, well, I, I'm going to live how I want to live. I, I'll ask forgiveness later, and then I get eternal life, right? That's a deal. That's not how it works. Repentance to turn. That's what that word means, to turn. And that doesn't mean that I don't struggle going forward. We all, like sheep, go astray many times. The Bible says a righteous man may fall seven times, but he gets back up. We are righteous in the righteousness of Christ alone. There's much more to be said on that. These are things that occupy endless hours of study. But I want you to know what this gospel is spoken of here in, 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 in Daniel 9. Because if I just gloss over, he was cut off, but not for himself. And don't remind us of that everlasting gospel, that essential core truth to the Christian faith, that we have a father who forgives us through his son and the merits of his blood and sacrifice on the cross. That is the most important truth in the history of the universe, the plan of redemption. But we repent. We say, I hate my sin. I don't want it. I forsake it. I turn to Jesus and away from self and sin. Turn from your wicked ways and he be healed, it says in 2 Chronicles. That habit, that character trait, I don't want it. My conscience troubles me when I do. Pick your thing. I want to I have freedom from that. And Jesus forgives you and he sets you free. Like the great gospel hymn by Charles Wesley, My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. There's one more verse. <clears throat> There's more about this cut-off experience. He shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. Well, that's not difficult for us at this point to figure out what that one week is, is it? Because he came 27 AD at the 483-year point. There's seven more years to go, or one week of years. And it says, he will confirm a covenant with many for one week. Well, that, that actually tells us back to the beginning about the end of the seven week, 70 weeks is your probationary time. Do you want a covenant with your God? Do you want to come back to him? Do you want to be his bride? That's a covenant, marriage. He will confirm that covenant. It's like, this is overtime. Not overtime. This is a two-minute warning. You've got seven more years. The Messiah, your Messiah is here. And Jesus says, I've come to minister to the lost sheep of Israel. He's confirming a covenant with many for seven years. But in the middle of that week, or in the middle of that seven years, I'm in verse 27, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. What is that talking about? Do you know about the ancient lamb sacrifices? How the Israelite nation was required to kill lambs as their worship ceremony. And it was all foreshadowing, prefiguring, symbolizing the lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. Jesus Christ, the lamb of God. John the Baptist said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away your sin. So it says here, He's going to bring an end to that. And we're going to bring an end to the lamb sacrifices. What happened when he died on the cross? Students of the Gospels. The temple curtain tore from top to bottom. And that old sanctuary service with the holy place and the most holy place and the lamb sacrifices and everything they did ended. It was no longer valid because you now have the fulfillment of it in Christ. So he, had, he brought an end to sacrifice of the temple. 
in the middle of the week. Okay, you're just getting ridiculous with me now. Did you catch that? At what point after Jesus' baptism, in a seven-year period of time, how long was Jesus' ministry? It was three and a half years. He died in the middle of it. And the sacrificing and, 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 and the temple ended. This is not possible by probabilities. A person doesn't self-fulfill their own prophecies and decide, how, you know, I'm going to get crucified right there in the spring, three and a half years from when I started my ministry in the fall. Um, this is prophesied. And wow. So that cut off but not for himself moment was actually indicated in the time prophecy as well. Now, you're going to get to the very end here. What, what would the year be at the end of that seven years? It would be 34 A.D. So as we wrap up the prophecy, does anything special happen in 34 A.D.? Well, you know, Luke wrote another book. It's in your Bible. It's called Acts. And in the book of Acts, it's recorded that what we know is what we call 34 A.D., there was this, the, the evangelist Stephen was stoned by the Jewish authorities and the rulers of their nation rejected their own Messiah. Their 70 years was sealed, sadly, as a nation. That doesn't mean Jews can't be saved. They, of course, can. Any individual can be saved from any nation in any background. It doesn't matter what religion you grow up in, what your struggles are. Every person can come to the cross and receive that free gift. But as a nation, and we'll, we'll study this more another time, their probationary period finished in 34 AD. Isn't it interesting that it just so happened that they stoned Stephen, and then Paul says, I go to the Gentiles. The Gentiles are the non-Jews. Incredible prophecy. Was that prophecy clear? Bring questions tomorrow if it wasn't. But as we think about the signs of the times of our world, aren't you glad we have the solution in Jesus? There is no fear. There is no fear. Fear is an illusion. Rest in the peace of the finished work of Christ at the cross. And if Daniel 9 is this clear, then I can know that the prophecies about Jesus' second coming are just, are just as certain. That we will be in a heavenly home in no time. The signs are showing that it's coming soon. Remember that Titanic? Can you believe in 2012 a cruise ship sank? With all the modern techniques we have. It was an Italian cruise ship called the Costa Concordia. It ran aground on rocks just off an island on Italy's west coast. Why? This time it wasn't messages that were coming in that they were ignoring, but it was a simple map that the captain had that he didn't follow. It was casual about it, maybe showing off a bit. Well, you know, this is our map. Minutes after the crash, the emergency lights flickered on. The ship was drifting away from the island already listing to the port side. And the passengers were getting mixed messages. Everything is fine, the, the crew told the passengers. 33 passengers and crew lost their lives. Now, do you think there are some alerts flashing in our world today like they were on that boat, but also some voices saying, no big deal, nothing to see, don't waste your time with Bible fanatics and these crazy ideas of prophecy. Go back to sleep. The world will go on like it always has. If we're still that naive after the last few years, I, I, you need more help than I can give you. But I know that you are here to study God's Word. And if there's no other reason to study His Word than just to know Jesus Christ as your Savior now, it doesn't need to be the terrors of the day that is coming that wake us up. But when I see my world doing this, when I see my society doing this, it does drive me with a greater sense of urgency to teach these truths, to live these truths, and to love that Messiah. If that's your desire tonight, give me a hand in the air. Do you want to say yes to Jesus tonight? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the sacrifice of your Son. We are so unworthy to receive that free gift, but we know that it is your delight to give it. 
So we simply confess our sins before you and claim the Bible promise that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Help us to truly find repentance that you grant unto us according to your word. We can't repent properly in our own strength. We just need to be made willing by your spirit to truly turn from sin and turn to Jesus. Thank you for that free gift. And as we continue our study together night after night, abide with us and draw us closer to each other and to you. In Jesus' name, amen.